Our sermon title today is In the Last Days, On Whom Will You Call? And as I I think about that and, and, and what that entails, it brings up connotations upon whom our world is already calling because it presupposes something. A title always presupposes something. And if you look in our world today, we're often told and we hear it on the news that we are living in unprecedented times. That's not true. We are living in biblical times. Okay? It's not unprecedented. Jesus told us it was coming. There's nothing that He doesn't know. So when the world says, it's unprecedented, tell them, have you read the book lately? Because this time of our culture, two-thirds of the New Testament is written about. Two-thirds of our New Testament is written. The prophecies of the New Testament all speak of this time. We are here. Okay? We are where God has said, and it's coming to this point. What am I speaking of? What am I talking about? Well, I want you to think about where our world is and what seems to be happening. So in that, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy. Okay? I want you to turn to 2 Timothy and chapter 3. 2 Timothy and chapter 3. Now, i got a lot I need to get said here, and I have a short time to do it, So, let's get to it. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And you're going to be amazed at what you see here because all of a sudden, lights are going to start going off in your brain. And you're going to realize that we are here. Okay? And and we've got something to do. And we're going to do something today. It says in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. None of us are seeing any of that in our world right now, right? There are no difficult times anywhere. There's no uprising on college campuses in the United States. There are no cities that are being burnt down. You know, we're not seeing any turmoil anywhere, right? Everything's coming up roses. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Wow! How many of you see that stuff happening right now, today, on a daily basis, And it is meant to be the norm. Because as soon as you start speaking about God, as soon as you start speaking about liberty, as soon as you start speaking about freedoms, all of a sudden we find out that we are so oppressed. Because we're a bunch of hypocrites. And we're a bunch of fascists. So we're going to go out there and burn down a college. No, I don't think any Christians are doing that. But what we see is exactly what's happening. We see in our culture that this this age of self-relativism is is exactly what we're speaking of here. Where people are going to be lovers of self. Do you realize that there's a new word in the dictionary? How many of you realize there's a new word in the dictionary? And how many of you know what it is? I dare say many of you use it. And many of you have done it. How many of you have ever taken a selfie? Really? Really? I think it is so amazing because we live in the most self-relevant time ever. Since the beginning of time, since the recording of history, we have not known any such time. Ah, wrong chicken. Because it says in the days of Noah, every man did as he thought was best. We are living in the days of Noah. And how shall it be at the end of time? It shall be as in the days of Noah. We're here. Here. 
Our youth are so inundated with this. Our culture is so wrapped up in self and what I think is right and what I m- matter matters, right? And if, if, if you don't matter to what I matter, then you don't matter. You're arrogant. You're hypocritical. You're, you're, you're everything that I need to come against. Am I speaking out of turn? Or am I speaking the relativism that we see ourselves in today? Jesus warned about this. The Apostle Paul wrote books about this. John writes about it. Peter writes about it. All we have to do is read the New Testament and we realize, oh my goodness, do you realize that we are living in the most precedented times that have ever been written about? Because we've been warned this time's coming. And this, I'm telling you right now, folks, this is not a time for Christians to, to step down and say, oh my gosh, the end is here. We need to, we, we need to circle the wagons and, we, and we, you know, we need to put up the barriers and barricade the windows and lock the doors. Oh my goodness. We need to be out there in this world confronting this world, talking to this world, bringing light into this world. Because there are people out there, I'll tell you right now, the self-relativism is the most damning thing that can ever happen in the human life. Because self-relativism says, I am God. You know that's the sin of Satan. That is the sin of Satan. And he's finally gotten our young people there. He's been trying for centuries, centuries to get this to come to this point. And what we're seeing, if you look around, we're seeing the time of the Gentiles reach its fullness. Now, it so amazes me because so many people have said, you know, throughout history, well, that means that when the last gentle that's going to believe finally believes, then God will close the kingdom and bring about the end. Wrong chicken. (laughs) If God says it, He says it somewhere else. Every time God speaks about a fullness coming in, God is speaking about the fullness of someone's sin. Okay? In the Old Testament, we read time after time after time where God brought His judgments upon whole nations because the fullness of their sin had come in before Him. And we are fast approaching that day. How many of you have ever read where it says in the Scriptures, hasten the day of the Lord? Does that mean we're supposed to add to sin so that it'll, it'll finally come to the place where you know, it's reached its fullness? No. When we are hastening the day, what we are doing is we are helping people make those line crosses. Okay? We are getting people to say yes to the Lord, no to sin, or no to the Lord, or no to yes to sin. Okay, I want to make sure I got that right. Got my own brain confused there. Because what we're doing is we are helping God establish the sheep and the goats. That's hastening the day. And you and I also need to understand that as we look at this world, I mean, look at the things that that, that, that Timothy writes here. They're boastful, lovers of money, revilers, disobedient to their parents. None of you parents out there, your children are so wonderful. They listen to everything that you tell. (laughs) Miss Amy's going to preach for a moment. We've all been there, right? Kids. Teens. Youth. Why do you think there's such a struggle? Do you realize the culture that you are living in is trying to trip you up? The culture that you are living in. You're out there. You're in these schools. All right? You're out there. You're in among these other kids. And you know, but but Sally gets to do this. You know what my mom used to tell me? If Ronnie would jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, should I let you? Number one, I didn't know what the Golden Gate Bridge was, so I, you know, maybe it was a swimming hole. I didn't know. (laughs) 
It wasn't until I got a little bit older that I kind of understood that. But the reality is, if it's going to hurt you, should I let you do it as your parents? No. Now, have there been struggles between parents and kids? Parents. All right. You all remember when you were a kid and your parents would say to you, one of these days, pow, zoom. You know, how many of you that watched the honeymooners, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and pastor just dated himself very much so. But we understand, we are seeing an increase of it exponentially around us today. Where it is not only because, you know, when we were growing up, you know, it was called rebellion. Today, it's the culture. It, it is our culture. Everybody's opinion is self-absorbed, and the only opinion that matters is mine. And if you are not going to align with my opinion, my values, my morals, then you don't matter, and I can do whatever I want to do, and if you say anything to me, you're being hypocritical. What? I just got a cartoon the other day. I get these things from a magazine that, that I subscribe to, an electronic magazine. And it showed President Obama, ex-President Obama, standing in front of one of the Supreme Court justices. And he says, open bathrooms for boys and girls or you lose your federal funding. And the Supreme Court justice says, cool. President Obama says, follow the laws on immigration or lose your federal funding. And the Supreme Court Justice says, unconstitutional. Follow the laws of the land and it's unconstitutional? Do something morally wicked and it's cool? That's where our society has become Upside down. Backwards. We see these things. They are lovers of self. We live in a perverted world because that's what Satan wants us to be. A perverted people. It's called sin. And we have emulated sin to the point of being something to speak about and, and hold up and say, looky what I can do and get away with. And everybody's supposed to just accept it. But we as Christians are not supposed to accept it. We as Christ-like ones are to have a different way. I want you to look back, okay? Just look back a few chapters, or a few lines, actually. I want you to look back to verses, chapter 2, verses 22 through 26. And it says this, Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness. Why does God say that? Because as kids, we all want what we want. Amen? Teenagers, I want you to hear this. Okay? If you talk to mom and dad, if you talk to mom and dad, seriously talk to mom and dad, and ask them, what kind of things did you do when you were a kid? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to tell you right now, your ears will spin. Okay? Turn around and talk to somebody else behind you that you look up to in the church. And all of a sudden, your jaw, your jaw will hit the floor because if we're honest, we will find that there is nothing new under the sun. Amen? However, God says we're not to live that way. What does He say? He says, now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach patience when wronged, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. This is the hastening of the day. This is the separating of the sheep and the goats, where we are coming to a people who are so filled with self 
that we don't, and we just talked about this today, don't judge them. Discern, exhort, and encourage. I'm telling you, if God's not in control of this church, I don't know who is. Okay? Because I know I'm certainly not. If you're not plugged into discipleship, you need to get plugged into discipleship. Especially in these last days. And I mean that with all my heart. Because you are not going to be able to stand up under this world and the things it's going to bring at you without having the full armor of God upon you. And that does not mean that you can simply get up in the morning and, and recite Ephesians 6 and 10 through 20. Okay? Because if that's all you're doing, if you're not in that Word, getting it, chewing on the meat of that Word, working it out with other brothers and sisters, because that means they're going to be there to help you work. If you're doing it alone, guess what's going to happen when the tough times come? You're going to fall away. It's going to rip you right out and you're going to say, well, you know, I just, I, okay, I'm just going to shut up and I'll go away now. And that's not what God wants because we are not to be those who shrink away. Because when we shrink away, Christ pulls away from us. And we need to remember that. And coming into these last days, we have to stay strong in the Lord. We need each other to be in the Lord. Jesus has a word for each and every one of us because we need to understand that, that as this time of the Gentiles reaches its fullness, how much more sin is going to come into our world? It's not that there's going to be much more sin in our world. It's simply that it's going to be recognized and it's going to be accepted. So therefore, it, the things that are done in darkness are going to come out. Okay? It's like cockroaches. Okay? It's like cockroaches. When you shut the lights off, when do they come out? You know, they don't come out in the daylight, right? But all of a sudden, you flick on a light, you know, and, and what happens when there are cockroaches present? I, like some of you ladies are like, oh, mm, mm. but isn't that what happens? You know, all of a sudden you see them scurrying off. But what we're going to see is they're not going to scurry. They are going to stand in defiance. Okay? My brother-in-law used to work at a paper company down in York, Pennsylvania where they would process paper, they would get in those big bales from like Walmart and all those places, and they would run it through a processor, a pulper. And it was amazing, because I, I bet you don't know this, but cockroaches love rotten paper. Okay? They love rotten paper because they love the glue that's in there. Okay? That's sugar. That's sugar. And, and he would tell me, he'd say, Man, he said, Rich, you ought to see the cockroaches at that place. He said, them things are four inches long and they have wings and they fly. And I was like, nah, come on. You know, you're pulling my leg. And then he brought one home. Okay? And I'm telling you right now, he was not lying. When you stepped on them, they went crunch. Okay? <laughs> it wasn't a little snap, crackle, pop. It was crunch. And that's what we see in our world. We've got these cockroaches that are coming out and they're standing up and they're hissing at us because it's their day. The end is coming. All we have to do is look at it. But we should never ever be afraid. We need to understand God has a word for us. And this is what I want to get into. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 10. I got, I got this scripture and one more. And then we're going to do something neat today. John chapter 10. Whew. Laying this foundation. I'm trying to lay it quickly. I could speak on this stuff and it should be a whole nother sermon, but God has something He wants us to do today and we're going to do this. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Now please, I want you to understand, uh, the reason I'm taking this here is because this world is listening to somebody's voice. This world is listening to somebody's voice and that voice is turning them inward to self. Okay, It's turning them inward to self. To be lovers of self. 
lovers of pleasure, lovers of, of, of the money, lovers of, of the things that, that are inward seeking. All right? God wants us to be outwardly. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He puts forth all his own. He goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger will simply not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This world is doing what they're doing because they're following a voice that they know. But we need to help teach them a new voice. We need to help teach them that there is a good shepherd. Because the one who's broken in on their lives has come to rob, steal, and kill. Because that's what He's doing to them. They're finding death. But we know there is life. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. That's talking about us, those who are sealed in the Holy Spirit. Alright? I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He's talking about eternal life there, folks. He's talking about heaven and glory. He's talking about knowing the Father and having a relationship that will last forever. When these people who are in this world die to this world, they also will die to God. There will be no abundant life. There will be abundant death. And separation, complete and total from God for all eternity. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd that lays down His life for the sheep. He who is the hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will hear My voice. And they will become one, with one, they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves Me because I lay down My life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from Me, but I lay it down of My own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. Blessed be the Word of the Lord. Amen. There is power in that Word. There is strength in that Word. Because we have a shepherd who calls us by name. We have a shepherd who leads us to life. We are those other sheep. Jesus was talking to Israel. And they rejected Him. And He said, fine, I'm going to go out to get my other sheep that are out in the other pastures, in the outer pastures. And that's where He is right now. And He is calling us. And He has appointed us to be under shepherds as well. And we need to be out there calling those sheep, helping those sheep to hear the Word of the Lord. We know that there is a day and a time coming when the Word of God is going to do something really powerful and really unique. What am I talking about? I want you to turn to the book of Acts. I want you to turn to the book of Acts in the second chapter. Because this is, this is powerful stuff. This is God moving as only God can do. And the time, I'm telling you, is coming. And it's coming quickly. And we're either going to be part of it or we're going to be void of it. And I want us to be part of it as a church and as individuals, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. I want you to get pumped up. I want you to get fired up. I want you to understand God has something for you. This whole last several weeks, during, during Lent, building up to Easter, I talked about having that rhema moment. I talked about God having a Word for your life. And we learned how Christ is that Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word... The Word is God. I don't like that past tense. <coughs> because He's not dead. 
But we need to be a resurrected church. We need to be the church of Jesus Christ. And what does he have to say about the, the, the church of Jesus Christ? The Apostle Paul made this, or the Apostle Peter made this proclamation of what the end time is going to look like. Look at Acts 2, 17. And it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour forth my Spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved to the glory of God. May I have an amen. amen. Are you ready to be part of that church? Are you ready to be part of that prophetic utterance that's going to be going out into this world? Because right now, this world needs a prophetic utterance. This world needs the Word of God in everything it is because it is so self-centered and self-seeking. Now I'm going to tell you, that's going to mean that you're going to be rejected by many, but to those whom Christ is saving, you will be heard. But we have to speak those words of prophecy. We have to speak those dreams and those visions into this world. We have got to get out of ourselves. All right, We've got to be a got to stop being afraid of self, being afraid of this world. We have a victor, a conqueror who has overcome the world. There should be no fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Who is perfect love? Jesus Christ. We can say the Sunday school answer. Jesus. Say it like you mean it. Jesus. Because He is perfect love. And He casts out all fear. And we have nothing to be afraid of except our own ignorance. And ignorance means lack of knowing. Well, I just informed you. The light bulb just went on and the cockroaches are going to flee. Because when we walk into the room, it's not the light of man we're shining. It's the light of God. Of Jesus Christ. But we need to get in tune with it. How do we get in tune with the Word of God? How do we get in tune with the Spirit of God? Well, we're going to do it right now. Never done this in a church service in my life. I want you to look around, choose three people. Three people to a group. I want you to turn your chairs to each other, and you're going to start to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to pray. If you have a scripture, your favorite scripture, open your Bible, get to your scripture. You can do that while I'm talking because I want you to share scripture with each other. Remember, some of the best things we can do is, is pray scripture to God, okay? Putting his word back up there because what we're going to do, there's a prophetic word that needs to be spoken in this church today. You're going to get together in groups of three. In groups of three. I want you to get together in groups of three. And then you are going to tell me what God has said to you when we're done. What? Yes. God has a word. I want you to think about this. Now I want you to think about it. Start getting your groups. Start moving your chairs. Start moving your chairs. Groups of three. Groups of three. You can make a group of four if you, want to. If you have to. Make a group of four. But I'd like it to be groups of three. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? like it to be three. But it can be four if it has to. God is going to tell you. God is going to speak to you. You're going to hear words in your spirit. You're going to see a picture. Somebody may be praying. Somebody may be talking. And you may just get this picture in your mind. You three guys back here at the sound booth, you're a group. Right? I want you to be praying. I want you to be praying. Yeah, get Lydia in there. and Amber, spin around. There's a group of three. And then you four here. That's good. Awesome. You're doing it. God is going to speak to you. Start praying. I'm going to talk while you're doing this. God is going to speak to you. God is going to give you visions. 
He's going to put a picture in your mind where you're going to say, Pastor, I don't understand this, but I just had this picture of blah. That's a vision, people. God's going to bring a word to your spirit where He's going, to, He's going to say something to you and you need to say it to us, whatever it may be. And if you're watching on the internet right now, you need to be in prayer. You need to be seeking God out right now because He has a word that He wants to speak to you and through you to the community that's around you. You're part of this move that God is making in that church. And you, you are important. You are one of His sheep. And He has appointed you to go and take that word out also. Get into prayer. Find somebody right now. And if you can't, then just, just put your hands on the TV screen right now and pray with this church as they're praying. God's not a respecter of time. He's beyond time. So He knows where your heart is and where your spirit is. Speak to the Lord right now and receive from Him a message of hope, a message of deliverance, a message to be taken out into this world, a message to lift you up and to help you bring people to the light of Jesus Christ. Pray. Pray. So Lord, I'm going to ask even now, I'm going to ask even now that if the Lord has spoken to you and I know He has spoken to you, raise a hand. Raise a hand. Raise your hand. JB, what did he say? Speak loud. Very good. Brother David, what is he saying? Brother Bob. Don't get weary. Don't grow weary. What's he saying? Eva. Do not fear. What's he saying? Enter through the narrow gate. What's he saying, church? Go. 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 Wayne. For the way of the world is put on your spiritual armor and he will protect you against evil. Amen. What's he saying? Amen. Amen. Gloria. To serve, to serve humbly and joyfully. Amen. What's he saying, church? What's he saying, church? Rely on him. Frog it. Oh, amen. What's he saying, church? What's he saying, church? Miss Mick. Believe in miracles. Oh, baby, believe in miracles. Every time a soul gets saved, it's a miracle. What's he saying, church? My question is this, church. Is God talking to His church? Are we listening for His voice? Are we searching Him out? We have a voice that calls to us, each and every one of us. But we need to get together and pray and seek His face. For when we seek Him with all our heart, we will be found by Him, declares the Lord. And He will give us the hope that brings forth our future. That's Jeremiah 29.11, Pastor's rendition, alright? <laughs> But you need to understand, this cannot stop. What you are looking at right now is what the church is supposed to be about. This happens in discipleship. This happens in prayer groups. This happens because the body of Christ plans it to happen. And then we go forth as a unified body, having heard the voice of God, having seen His visions, dreamed His dreams, and then moving into a world that does not know His light. For we are that light empowered by God to do the works of God in this world. I know this is something I've never asked you to do before, and I may ask you to do it again. Because I'll guarantee you, I want you to start thinking about what this year means. Do you know this year there are several things happening between now and the end of the year that are biblically prophesied 
during one of the feasts, in fact, right after the feast, the United States of America is going to experience a complete and total solar eclipse. It goes from Georgia all the way across the nation, right across the heart of the nation, to Washington. This year, in September, the sign of revelation will literally be in the sky where the woman will be with child. She has the 12 crowns on her head and she delivers the child and the moon is at her feet and the sun, she is clothed in the sun. That is, that is the stars. Okay, God uses the stars. God put the stars there. That happens. Jupiter comes in, oscillates. It's oscillating right now for nine months in the womb of the virgin and then it comes out between her legs. The, the, the Jupiter is always considered the planet that represents Christ. It's, it's called the Christ star. Okay? We see these signs are here. We read the Scripture and we see we're here. Are we going to be here for God? Are we going to be available to God to be the church of Jesus Christ? God's getting ready to do some moves in this church. How many times has pastor ever asked you to do something like this? Not in my 20 years. When I told Miss Sally what we were doing, she said, oh my goodness. <laughs> and I said, this is a good thing. Because this is what it's about. And he can't stop here. We need to be calling each other on the phone and saying, hey, God's laying this on my spirit. And then we need to pray. And we need to move. I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, this is a beginning. This is a beginning. God is going to do something miraculous in the next weeks, months, year, two years, whatever we have left. Are you really ready? I am. I pray we as a church are. I want to see this place packed. Not because I want something, but because there are souls that need saved. There are souls. There are people in your life. There are people you work with. There are friends in, in your life. There are family members who need saved. We need to speak the Word. Because it's the only way they're going to hear it. Let's pray. Gracious Father, You are speaking to Your church. And it's not about us. It's not about who we are. We're not to fear. We're not to give up. We're not to grow weary. What does all that mean? That means that we're to be out there in the world. We're to put on that full armor. We are to, to see that You are our provision. We are to understand that You have a way that is good and right. And we are to be about the work that You give us. For Lord, there is this day spoken about 2,000 years ago. And Lord, we're living in it. This is biblical time. This is prophetic time. This is the time of the church of Jesus Christ. And may we be found faithful. Jesus says when he returns, will he find faith? I believe one of the things he's speaking about there, Lord, is will you find the church at work? May we be at work. Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, and God's church says, amen. and amen.